early childhood and a specialist in psychometry. Ms. Hobson does tutoring from K through two scholars and the summer reading program. Ms. Hobson says as an educator, she finds it necessary to convey to her students that the focus needs to be on the children in the class, not the material <coughs> or the test. Ms. Burden says Ms. Hobson learned well and obtained the tools to teach children to become productive citizens while showing them techniques to make positive choices and connect with the skills necessary to grow academically. We present to you Ms. LaQuinta Hobson. I am completely honored by such an award and achievement. I could not have come this far without God, the constant guidance from my mom, the encouragement and support from my the best principal, Ms. Burton, and my professor, Dr. Fish, and also my son said I had to put him in there, my son, Jaden. When I decided to become a teacher, I just wanted to touch young minds. I wanted to be that teacher that was very hands-on with students, always doing new things and exciting things with them, all while disguising it as learning. I didn't know how rewarding yet challenging this profession would be. During my years at Jackson State, I had the pleasure of meeting many mentors that taught me that an educator's job does not end when the students leave the classroom. We must always continue to think outside the box to be able to reach our students. Every child is capable of learning. This was a challenge I took on 100%. And to see all my work, being honored today is a great feeling. Coming from a family of nurses, my mom, my sister, my brother, and my aunt, many thought that's the path that I was going to take. But teaching has always been my field of choice. I thought there was no better feeling than seeing one of my students master a task he or she may have struggled with. But I think the feeling in this moment surpasses that. Special thank you to the Community Foundations of Mississippi for recognizing me, LaQuinta Hobson, a kindergarten teacher at the best Lake Elementary. Our next honoree is Ms. Chandra Byers Smith. She's the lead exceptional education teacher at Lanier High School, where Ms. Valerie Bradley is the principal. She has 20 plus years teaching experience. She received her Master's of, in Educational Administration and Supervision at The Jackson State University in 2021. She received a Master's of Science degree at Capella University in 2017. She strives to create and execute with purpose of motivating students and others to be lifelong learners. She says she began with the end in mind of teaching students how to become law-abiding, self-sufficient educated, and articulate young adults. Her principal, Dr. Bradley, says Ms. Byers Smith has been actively involved with the youth by having the ability to connect and communicate by not judging them and using the resources that are provided. We present to you Ms. Chandra Byers Smith. It is indeed an honor to have my efforts recognized in this way by Ask for More Jas Jackson and the Community Foundation for Mississippi. And the majority of my profession, I've been working with the exception education population. I started out in language arts in West Bolivar School District, left, went into the corporate world, came back into education, and I chose to work with the exception education population because there were so many of our children that were being told what they could not do. And I don't believe in the word can't. My father was an educator, my mother was an educator, my uncle, my cousins, and it all, we all worked together. It took a village. My father not believe in the word can't. My children at home and my students that I work with and their teachers don't say what they can't do. Being an educator is a lifelong commitment. I strive once again to always be positive. That's with my coworkers, that's with my students, the community, whatever it may be, no matter what the situation is, always find the positive in it, always. I would like to thank so many individuals for their involvement in who I am today. Whether it be my professors, my teachers when I was growing up, my principals from then, and my current principal now, my second principal that I had when I first started at Lanier, every principal that I've ever had, I've always respected them and appreciated their leadership and I take something from each term 
My current principal, Dr. Valerie Bradley, I appreciate her so much for what she does for our children, what she does for us and the environment. I want to emphasize that I am a firm believer in it takes a village to raise our children. Thank you so much. Our next honoree is Ms. Nikita King Adams. She's a third grade teacher, ELA teacher at Reigns Elementary School. Ms. Dina Owens is her principal and Dion Woody is her assistant superintendent. She has eight years of teaching experience at Lake. She has a Bachelor of Education degree. Ms. Adams was recognized as Teacher of the Month for February 2023. She also is a volunteer for Habitat for Humanity and AmeriCorps. She says she believes each and every child has the potential to bring something unique and special to the world. She will help children to develop their potential by believing in them as capable individuals. She says she makes sure she makes her students feel safe, valued, successful, and that each one feels challenged with achievable goals. Ms. Owen says Ms. Adams is highly respected for her compassion and patience for children and for her general great attitude toward education. She's convinced that Ms. Adams is one of the most outstanding, hardest working, and devoted teachers she has ever had the pleasure of knowing. She is indeed an asset. We present to you Ms. Nikita King Adams. Thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity. I would like to thank my principal, Ms. Owens, for always believing in me. Thank you for nominating me for this outstanding award and for the Community Foundation for Mississippi and my supportive husband. Uh, teaching is not an easy job, but I strive daily to give it my all because I know in the end my scholars will benefit. Thank you again. Our next honoree is Miss Alicia White. It's a pre-K teacher at Van Winkle Elementary. Ms. Ashanti Barnes is her principal, and Ms. Dion Woody is the assistant superintendent. She has 10 years of experience in education. She received a bachelor's degree in child and family students and a master's degree in early childhood education. She received the JPS Rockstar Award December of 2021. Ms. White says she believes that it is her belief that a classroom should be a welcoming and accessible environment. It should be in a place in which students feel comfortable and are able to utilize the resources provided. She says that a good teacher cannot begin or continue to inspire learning if he or she is not also a learner. We present to you Ms. Alicia White. I first would like to say I am honored to be able to receive this um, Outstanding Educator Award. So I first want to thank my parents, my mom, my dad for always believing me and encouraging me. I also like to thank my principal, Ms. Ashanti Barnes. When COVID first um, started, um, we started off as um, Van Winkle um, first pre-K uh, pre-K school. Um, we was getting ready to record videos for our Parent Academy Award, and an email came through and said, "Would you like to participate?" And I overlooked the email because I didn't want to participate, but it came back to me again. <laughs> and I was like, "She must really want me to participate." So I said I would do it, but I didn't know what I was signing up for. And I looked, she was like, we have to do some recording. I was like, recording? I don't know about that. And I went to her, I said, I, do I got to learn a script or something? Because I'm shy. And she said, girl, you're so funny. But I was dead serious. <laughs> <laughs> so we did the recording. And after recording, I was so, yeah, I did not prepare. But I went in, and I, I had leaned, and I guess I did a good job. But she came to me, she said, you did an awesome job. Everybody was clapping. And she's like, you got to celebrate your mama right now. So I'm gonna take the time and celebrate my mama because it was because of her for believing in me that put me outside the box to make me to believe in myself. So I just want to thank her. I want to thank um, my colleague, Dr. Sling and Johnson, for always helping me out anytime I need it. And my mentor, she wasn't able to make it because we have PJs today, so she had The Jackson Public School meeting is now called to order. Board, we have three members present. We have two on the phone and one absent. Therefore, we have a quorum. We have all had an opportunity to review the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda as printed? So moved, Madam Chair. Second. Thank you. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. No nays. There being none, the motion is approved. We have all had an opportunity to review the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the October 3rd, 2023 regular board meeting and October the 10th, 2023 special board meeting minutes? Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No nays, there being none, the motion is approved. Now, the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mrs. Hilliard. Good evening, board members, and to all of our team members and community members and scholars, all of those who join us here this evening. We'll begin, as we typically do, with some highlights um, from all around JPS. Take it away, team members. They are talented and empowered teachers who demonstrate a high commitment to student achievement. Recognized and celebrated for their dedication and commitment to transforming lives through excellence in education. My educators. Without you, there would be no me. A shout out to Ask for More Jackson for asking the question. Where are the outstanding educators? I chose to work with the exceptional education population because there were so many of our children that were being told what they could not do. Several JPS educators were honored by Ask for More Jackson and the Community Foundation for Mississippi. The mission of the Community Foundation is to connect people who care about things with folks who do the things they care about. We presented awards to those recognized as JPS's 2023 Outstanding Educators. Teaching is not an easy job, but I strive daily to give it my all. I started building a list of colleges that I want to apply to at the end of last year. Her dedication and hard work pays off in a big way for Jim Hill High School scholar Dana Bolden. Scholarships to Ivy League schools, to Drake University, that's a testament to the hard work of Jackson Public Schools. Dana Bolden received offers of over a million dollars in academic scholarships. Keep applying to the schools, keep getting the money, do your FAFSA, Make sure you and your parents do everything that you need to do. I do all of them. I've applied to probably 60 and got accepted to 34 so far, and I have a lot more coming. If you have fewer scholars in the building, the cost per student is higher. Parents, family members, and many more attended the first of four scheduled JPS town hall meetings. Take a step back and look at our opportunities to really increase our competitive Age. Attendees had the opportunity to hear a bold vision about the future of JPS schools. Are we prepared to sell or lease or perhaps even raise a building? Town hall attendees had an opportunity to ask questions. Pull some parents in. Pull some of the community leaders in. The people are moving out of Jackson. He can't leave all the schools up. He has to stop and close some schools up. Dr. Eric L. Green presented his optimization plan addressing the current financial state of JPS schools and how best to move forward eliminating debt and still providing exceptional education to scholars. The goal is to create some savings so that we can reinvest in smart ways in other places. Some parents and citizens are speaking out about the district's optimization plan. I'm a product of Jackson Public Schools. We have a lot of buildings in the city that the district is spending a lot of resources on. Um, it's really important that we harness those resources uh, to do what's best for our children and the families that they come from. I understand the feelings, the emotional uh, ties to a lot of our schools, but we have to think about it in terms of business. We are in the business of educating students. We are in the business of, of education. The next community meeting will take place Monday, October 30th at Callaway High, located at 601 Beasley Road from 6 p.m. till 7.30 p.m. Please visit our website at jackson.k12.ms.us. Follow us on Facebook at Jackson Public Schools, on Instagram at JPS Student Voices, on Twitter at JPS District,
Comcast channels 18 and 19. And YouTube at youtube.com slash JPSITV. I want to thank our team, uh, as always, for their work on uh, producing those, those highlights for us. Uh, board members and to the entire JPS community, I do want to provide a few um, updates or, or uh, um, some additional remarks with regard to our optimization plan. The plan mm -hmm. will help us, as I've stated and as we've shared previously, will help us to reinvest into our remaining schools and to ensure that all of our scholars learn in a safe and functioning and vibrant learning environment. Uh, I do want to stress that the plan was developed in response to our continued and dramatic enrollment decline, um, as well as some of the cur current facility conditions that we've heard lots about over the years and, you know, have, have gotten a lot of feedback on several of our schools and some of the challenges there, mm -hmm. as well as the high cost of those um, required repairs. Performance, board members and to our community members, performance, performance was not a criterion used to identify those schools. I'll say it again, performance, academic performance or any other performance measures that was not used, that was not a criterion used to identify the schools. It was all about the um, cost of running those schools with declining enrollment and the major uh, renovations necessary to reinvest in those schools. At the same time, I do want to uh, state again, as I've stated previously, that our performance, uh, the performance of the schools has little to do with the building itself and everything to do with the educators and with the scholars who are putting in the hard work to achieve at high levels. Our scholars, our teachers, administrators, they're the keys to the success wherever they're operating, whether it's in building A or building B. And I want to thank those uh, scholars and parents and team members and community members, all of those who have shared their feedback with us thus far. Uh, they've given us lots to, to consider, and I'm confident that our final set of recommendations will be stronger as a result of their engagement. Um, we will host additional community forums, as you uh, heard there on the highlights reel to discuss the optimization plan um, and those dates, the, the coming dates as scheduled, are October the 30th at Callaway High School, November the 6th at Provine High School, and November the 14th at Murrah High School. Uh, once we've gathered and considered all of the feedback uh, from various stakeholders and reviewed the needs of our district and all of the buildings that we have, and as well uh, reconsidered all the viable options. Again, I'll say viable options for moving forward. We'll present a final set of recommendations to the board on, on December the 5th. And so we've got a little bit of time between now and then. We've got three more formal scheduled um, community engagement uh, sessions. We're also uh, developing some other uh, smaller group sessions with uh, various uh, organizations uh, here in the city. And so we're looking forward to the continued engagement on that subject. And we know that, again, at the end of it all, we'll have a stronger set of recommendations to the board as a result of that engagement. And now, board members, you'll recall, hopefully you'll recall, uh, that in a previous board meeting we discussed a recommendation to issue bonds of uh, $57 million or up to $57 million um, as opposed to the, the $30 million that we originally presented to you. And I wanted to provide a little more clarity on that matter. So according to uh, the Mississippi Code Section 3759.111, it limits all debt issuances to 20 years with the exception of transportation notes. So that code again is 3759-111, and it limits all debt is issuances to 20 years with the exception of transportation notes. That plus the current value of our mills and the, the three mill note, uh, the current value is about $3.2 million. Given those two limitations or conditions, uh, it's impossible for us to issue, issue a bond of $57 million at this time. 
So our recommendation remains roughly the same. Um, we were talking about 30 million. It's, uh, they've worked the numbers again, and looks like we could um, uh, do 34.5 million for 15 years um, using 100% of the 3.2 million um, that I already mentioned that our annual, that our annual um, notes, um, the value of our annual notes, uh, the value of our notes annually. Um, and so just want to, to come back around to you. I know we had had some conversation of why not, you know, go for the 57 million if that's an option to us. When we went back to our folks and, and reviewed the, the conditions, we're actually limited um, to, to that amount um, in the 20 years. And so what we could do is uh, and will do is to continue to evaluate um, our options over the next few years. We'll have some of the notes that, that sunset that, that will close out, and so we may have some additional opportunities to go back and issue the remaining 22.5. Um, but, but that's something that we'll be reviewing over time, and we'll come back to you if, if there's an opportunity for us to seize some of that additional uh, money. <clears throat> and as we've discussed previously, again, the, the plan is to uh, utilize those dollars to reinvest in our buildings and make sure that we've got the, the facilities, both the, the um, learning facilities and uh, athletic or arts facilities. All right. Um, again, board members, you might recall that the Office of the General Counsel has presented um, for your approval several trips to the uh, for our scholars to attend the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. Several of our scholars have visited the museum and we have um, uh, some representatives here to share with us uh, their experiences and refl reflections. Uh, Attorney Harris will now join us to say a little more about those uh, trips to the museum and to uh, introduce our representatives this evening. Attorney Harris. Thank you, Dr. Green. Good evening, board members and um, Jackson Public Schools community. Um, as Dr. Green stated, we have been approving several grants from the Equal Justice Initiative that have allowed our scholars the opportunity to visit the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. So what I will do now is tell you just a little bit about what the museum offers, and then I will invite Ms. Buckhannon and other representatives up from CDC where the scholars were presented. And board members, what is in front of you are some tight scholar reflections from some of the trips that we have been approving and they have gone on, as well as some recommended readings from, on racial justice from the Equal Justice Initiative that you can view at your leisure. Okay. So the Legacy Museum offers a powerful, immersive journey through America's history of racial injustice. It is housed on the site of a cotton warehouse where enslaved black people were forced to labor in bondage. And the Legacy Museum tells the story of slavery in America and its legacy through interactive media, first-person narratives, world-class art, and data-rich exhibits. People are able to travel through a comprehensive history of the destructive violence that shaped our nation from the slave trade to the era of Jim Crow and racial terror lynchings to our current mass incarceration crisis and find inspiration in the soaring reflection space space and the world-class art gallery. So now we'll invite Ms. Buchanan up, uh, Ms. Deason, and um, the CDC is also led by uh, Dr. Cook, who's in the audience as well. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, protocol has already been established, so I'll just kind of give you a little bit about how um, the scholarship got started. So I'm a Donors Choose Ambassador, uh, and our things that I can't get for my classroom, I write <coughs> little mini grants, they call them. So in writing this grant, Equal Justice Initiative invited me to purchase some of their material for my students. So I saw that they had Just Mercy, and I heard about the movie, but I had never seen it at that time. So I was able to fund Just Mercy and a couple of other books. At this time, the students were transitioning from COVID to school. 
you know, so I was able to give them the book. They would have to read chapters and do reports on the chapters. So that's how they were graded during COVID. So at the end of that semester, the attorney for Equal Justice Initiative, Ms. Jacqueline Peace, called me and she said, Mrs. Buchanan, and I was like, yes. And she said, I would like to offer you a scholarship to bring your students to the Legacy Museum. And I said, yes. And she said, well, it's in Montgomery, Alabama. And then my thoughts started wondering, okay, how am I going to get students to Montgomery, Alabama? Mm -hmm. And so I asked her. And she said, well, we're going to pay for the trip. It's an all-expense-paid trip for you <coughs> since you're the first one from Mississippi that got this grant. She said, we're offering it to you in hopes that giving it to you, we can get more schools from Mississippi. So we did. I, I was so excited. I, I went in and talked to Dr. Cook, and Dr. Cook said, well, we got to take it before the board, and it may be all summer. It, well, it was coming up to the summer. So Dr. Cook said, well, once we present it to the board, we'll see where it goes. So the, he talked with uh, attorney Peace, and that's what she said. So all summer, I'm just contemplating, contemplating how we're going to do this, how we're going to do this. So when we got back, she had already sent me the information for the scholarship. And, uh, and I'm like, it must be a God. I know there's a God. <laughs> so uh, she called back and said, um, I'm giving you transportation. We're going to feed you, and we're going to pay your um, to go in the museums. So we weren't out of any money. Our first group, actually, that's our first group. So what they did, they sent me a preparation pack to talk to the students about where they were going, the impact that it, it would have on them because, you know, they hadn't talked about a lot of mass incarceration and slave trade or anything like that. So it was, if you haven't been, that's the trip you need to take. Amen. When I say touches Amen. deep down in your soul, Amen. it touches you. So I just encourage all of you, and, and we've taken three trips there. All expense paid, three trips, and actually in the spring we have another trip coming up. So I apologize for the scholars not being here, but because it was kind of a short notice, I just, but there's nothing that they can't say, that I can't say, and we have it in reflection. So Ms. Deason is going to read one of the scholars' true reflection of her trip. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Um, I'm going to read one reflection. Um, this is my day in Montgomery, Alabama. When we first made it there, our first tour guide made our arrival fun. He drove and explained everything that was around us. He joked with us to keep us entertained, and he showed us where Rosa Parks was arrested at the bus station. He showed us the waterfall and the streets and the people marched on, and he also showed us the building with the casket on top of the building. And she reflected she could not remember who the casket was of, but she does remember the casket, so she can go back and reflect on that later. When we went inside the museum, the food place beside, beside the park, we went in, smelled so good, but we didn't eat there, it just smelled so good. <laughs> when we first entered the museum, I liked the waves of the water screen that they had. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is amazing and so soothing to watch. Mm. I want something like that in my room. I was too interested in the way it, would, way it was than reading it, but we didn't have much time to really read much, and I wanted to see through the whole museum. The next part where we went, we had to walk through the display where they had many heads displayed with chains and things all around their necks. And the way we were being carried, uh, the way, excuse me, the way they were being carried from different places. Mm -hmm. The other part that was really interesting to me was when we had to walk up to the jail cells and innocent people and children were placed. I read some 
children were put into jail sentences for life. They put out projections of the people and the children that were in the jail. So when you walked up to the cell, they talked to us and they told us how they were treated. The two young brothers that they were locked up were very emotional. Hello, mommy. Have you seen our mommy? Next, I went to the part where they had the jelly beans in the jars with questions on the paper. And I asked the lady if it was a game and she told me, you can say that, but back in that, back then, in order to leave, you had to tell the exact number that was in the jar. For instance, I couldn't leave until I could tell how many seeds were in a watermelon. I was like, wow. I picked up the paper and I took a look for myself. The paper asked the weirdest questions and it said at the very top in bold letters, in order to register in this state, you had to answer each question with the correct answer. I remember three questions. The paper said that really amazed me. The first question was, was how many seeds were in the watermelon? And I'm like, different watermelons have different seeds, amounts of seeds. Some watermelons have no seeds. The second question was how many windows were in the White House in Washington, D.C.? And I'm like, how are we supposed to know? And who just thinks about this? The last question that I remember was about the jar of jelly beans that was in front of me asking how many jelly beans were in it. My guess was about 300 to 350, but I really couldn't tell, <laughs> laugh out loud. Coming from there, I went to the seating where we would pick up the phones and listen to some of the inmates that were falsely accused and put into jail. One man that was out in jail for defending himself against the police was put in jail when he was 17 and sentenced to life, so he looked like in his 50s. One thing that stood out to me was his hand. He only had his thumb on his right hand. He didn't explain what happened to it, though. After that were the jars of soil where each victim labeled on it to tell where they had been brutally assaulted or killed. After that, it was the people's mug shots of the bus boycott that were arrested. I really enjoyed myself and the ending where most everyone's picture was at, excuse me, where most everyone's picture was at, but not many and the ceiling surrounding it gave off how beautiful and inspirational the whole museum was. Thank you. And those are those that's just one of many scholars. Because after we visit the museum, they have to come back and do a report of their reflections. How did it make them feel? What did you see that that stood out to you. You know, there are several questions that they have to answer in their reports. So it, like I said, if you haven't been, I encourage each one of you, and I encourage the schools that have the scholarships to go ahead and take their students. It's very, very rewarding. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Ms. Buchanan. And, um, Board members, we look forward to bringing you more grants to approve and more scholar reflections to review. Thank you, Dr. Green. I just want to commend you, uh, Attorney Harris. Um, this doesn't fall neatly in your job description, <laughs> and yet uh, you've taken this on um, as a champion uh, in partnership with our colleagues throughout the schools. Have, have we had each of the schools to, to go yet? Not, most have gone, but not the high schools, I mean, right. Most of the high schools, not, not all of them, um, but we're working on that. And thank you just for your partnership and, and liais liaising with the, the folks from the museum. Um, and board members, I'll just put in a plug, we're, we're looking to get a board member um, and senior team um, trip to the museum for those of us who have not visited. Um, we do want to make sure that we make that available to us. 
last thing I'll say about this is um, I, I was so excited when I first learned that um, that you all were were seeking this trip and this opportunity. And, and I actually hadn't heard that story about how you got there, how you made that connection from the donors choose to them saying, hey, whoa, maybe you'd like to do this. And so um, I just appreciate the fact that you were open to the experience. And, and there again, it doesn't, I don't know that it necessarily fits so neatly in the, the curriculum or the content that you're working on is early childhood, correct? <laughs> right? But, and at the same time, like this understanding that we've got to be clear-eyed about the world around us, um, and we've got to help our scholars to develop, develop um, as whole people and not just in a particular content area. And so thank you for your vision for it and for helping to bring our district along. Your spark created all of what's happening across the district um, with regard to the museum, and frankly, it's it's caused me to to think more critically about other opportunities for us, inside and outside of the classroom, with regard to equity issues and and history, and just um, being really clear with ourselves and with anyone else who might be listening that we're not shying away from history, and and we're not shying away from realities, and and want to ensure that our scholars get what they need to. Um, move in the world and, and make a difference. So again, thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. And lastly, board members, tonight we have some champions in our midst. <laughs> you feel good, don't you? Yeah, all tingly inside. The Lanier High School girls volleyball team is the 2023 Mississippi High School Athletics Association 64A champion. <laughs> Amen. Now please join me in welcoming head coach Jonas James Jr. who will introduce these amazing scholar athletes. Coach, oh, and I think we have another Lanier type in here, <laughs> Dr. Bradley. You, you, you can't beat Dr. Bradley bragging on her babies. If you're, not, if you're not doing what she does, you're not really a principal, huh? That's right. Okay. That's right. Dr. Green, superintendent, Ms. Thomas, assistant superintendent, assistant superintendent high school. Dr. C. Vett. Board members, I am Valerie Bradley, Principal Lanier Junior Senior High School. I have to remember I always say that. That's right. Yes. Better known as A33 Nation. And y'all drive by at night and see the lights. We need the lights on for everybody. Drive by at night. Uh, I bring you greetings and well wishes. And we are really humbled and most appreciative that you all are helping us to recognize the hard work of our girls. So please give it up again for our girls. And they are being presented with a certificate. Everybody will get this. And it reads, Jackson Public Schools Certificate of Achievement. This certificate is presented to, and it will have each girl's name on it, Jackson Public Schools regular board meeting, October 17, 2023. Eric L. Green, superintendent. Thank you, Dr. Green. At this time, I'll let Jonas James, and y'all, he made me dress up. Uh, and he said we needed to look alike, so that's why we look alike. <laughs> Got to coordinate. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. It was a pleasure to be here before you today, and I thank y'all so much for helping me celebrate my young ladies of the hard work that they did, the fruits of their labor. Uh, not only are they good volleyball players, I want you to know that they got report cards up there. And 10 of my girls are on honor roll. There we go. Awesome. And these are my young ladies, uh, starting with Captain Isaria Wall. When I call your name, please come up. Isaria Wall. <laughs> Madison Dixon. <laughs> LaKayla Lewis. <laughs> Michaela Cole. <laughs> Patrice Wells. <laughs> Caitlin Griffin. <laughs> Tiani Taylor. <laughs> Mariel Forbes. 
Pretoria Champion, Shyla Smith, Jalea Jones, Kaylin Ramsey, Amaya Lattimore, Ariel Dancy. Thank y'all so much for celebrating these young ladies. We really, really appreciate y'all. Awesome. This is so wonderful. Congratulations, ladies. Congratulations. <laughs> Coach James, Principal Bradley, uh, to the entire, who, who do we have here from A33? Who, who, who else do we have here? Y'all come on, stand, stand on up. Let us see you. <laughs> Congratulations. It, so I will be honest, board members, I, um, I hadn't been keeping up. There's a whole team that makes all of this happen. And so I hadn't been keeping up um, that they were coming this evening. But on the news last night, and I think again this morning, I was seeing all of these um, teams that were winning, these uh, collegiate uh, teams, women's volleyball teams, who were um, just dominating. And I was watching just the, um, some of the interviews and, and some of their, their moves. I can't, I don't have all the language. I know Spike, but that's all I know. <laughs> but they were killing it. Killing it, dominating. And so as I, when I realized you all were coming here this evening and just thinking about where this sport can take you and the opportunities that you already are starting to create for yourselves and, of course, these loving educators for you, it's like, listen, don't, don't miss your blessing. This could be that pathway. How many of you are thinking about playing on the collegiate level. Anybody thinking about playing on the collegiate level? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, um, kudos to you, and you already have a name, so you can say, hey, I was on the championship team at Lanier. Right. Let me in and pay my way. That's right. Oh. <laughs> Might just work just like that. Let me in and pay my way. So. Kudos again to you. Y'all make me so proud. Make us so proud. Let's give them one more round of applause. <laughs> Champions. Let's see who else is going to bring home a championship um, trophy. Mm -hmm. That concludes all of my remarks for this evening. Um, Mrs. Hillier, thank you so much for indulging us, and thank you again for all of those who joined us to uh, celebrate and, and acknowledge our scholars and all that they are accomplishing. Thank you so much, Dr. Green, for that excellent report. And of course, um, are there comments from any of board members? Are there any comments? Just congratulations to all of them. I mean, just amazing work. Uh, just amazing work. Congratulations to all of them. And I, I'm really excited about the Legacy uh, Museum. I think that however we can make it work for every student that comes through JPS uh, to be able to experience it. And not only that, but our own museums that are here um, mm -hmm. in the city yes. uh, as well, because the, our history is so important. I say it, say it all the time. And I believe that our Jackson Public Schools history mm -hmm. uh, should be named in our hi Museum of uh, History there in, um, you know, 
it, it, it really should if it's not highlighted. I know we have some of the other things I've seen, uh, Russ College and other places that are highlighted there, but I believe Jackson Public Schools should be highlighted in that as well. So I just want to say we, whatever we can do to continue to preserve our history and allow our students to know what that history is all the way around, it just makes us better individuals, be able to work together better uh, and be able to create a, a better future for ourselves. Thank you, Mrs. Thompson. And while Sasha, I'll say that, no, please go ahead. I was just going to respond to to her comment. Uh huh. Um, I, I'm I'm adding on to what she said uh, here. It was such a touching presentation. It took me back to uh, my school days at Tugelo College. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that uh, Frank could echo a lot of that because he was much more involved in those kinds of things than I was. I was involved, but not to the extent that um, I was a little scary girl. <laughs> and <laughs> of course he wasn't. But uh, Mrs. Harris, I think you spearheaded this project. Attorney Harris. Uh, attorney. Um, She's helping to make it happen. Yes, you made it happen. You made it happen. I, I, I want to, to give the lead to Ms. Buckhannon, who kicked it off and started with CDC. And after that, we worked in conjunction with the assistant superintendent of high mm -hmm. schools in pushing the information out to other schools so that they could apply for and be awarded the grants. But Ms. Buckhannon started it off. OK. Yeah. All right. I just worked, well, to, approve, we, I just worked we, to approve the agreements. We want to, <laughs> we want to thank you for the role that you played in making it happen right here in our district. Amen. Absolutely. Thank so you all Mason. for your support. Mason. Yes, Dr. Green. Yes, ma'am. I um, just wanted to pick up on one of the things that Mrs. Thompson was saying. And I was looking for Kim Smith, Dr. Smith. I think she stepped out. She stepped out. She stepped out. But, um, and that's fine. Um, we. We, we do take our scholars to the museums, the two museums right here. Um, and I was just wondering if we have, if there's a particular grade level that we ensure that all are attending or if there's a, um, a broader kind of approach to getting our scholars to the two museums. So, so what you'll find is scholars are going at different ages and different mm -hmm. grades and with different teachers and levels and things. And so um, we'll, we'll work on a, a more uh, deliberate effort to make sure that everyone at some point goes. Um, because you're right, that's, that's so important. And it's right here. It, and, and also, <clears throat> I don't know if that student was able to make the connection of why those questions were being asked. Mm -hmm. I really would like for, you know, it's a good trip and all that, but I think people need to understand, they need to really get a good concept of what that was and how it's happening now. Mm -hmm. How it's happening right now. Mm -hmm. It's not that elementary, but it is still happening to keep us from voting. Mm -hmm. Our rights to vote are so important that they fight tooth and nail to keep us from doing it on every end, and we need to be able to help them to understand and correlate. And our young people, the better they understand it, the more passion and fire they'll have to really push us forward because um, just like she said, young people are the ones who push these movements mm -hmm. uh, for justice and righteousness. Just my take. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Are there other comments? Uh, I guess since I've been put on blast. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to certainly uh, ditto uh, what uh, Madam Chair uh, said and Mrs. Thompson. And I just want to say, uh, Honorable Superintendent, uh, just uh, Sunday night I heard of a, a foundation, a major foundation in the country has made possible for the Civil Rights Museum here uh, 10 or more people uh, to come at any time prearranged for free. 
So that doesn't that may also include transportation mm -hmm. uh, for for scholars. I'll connect with you. So, I'll, thank you, so. sir. Thank you. Thank each of you for your comments. Do we have any participants for public comments? You do. Okay. Before we get started, I just want to set the expectation for those speaking. You will have three minutes for your comments. The board believes the public's comment is very important. The board will listen and consider your comments, but we will not respond to this time. If there is an issue that you have not taken to leadership, at a particular school or to district administration, we encourage you to do so. Board members, the first one who signed up to address you this evening is Gwen Gardner, who would like to speak in support of the optimization plan. Greetings to the JPS Board of Trustees and Dr. Green. I just want to share a few comments about the opti optimization plan. Our organization, I'm now currently the executive director for Axmore Jackson. I'm a former teacher and a former principal mm -hmm. from Jackson Public Schools. And our organization over the last eight, nine years um, has been facilitating cultural learning walks we gather parents and community members, and we would visit the schools just looking for specific things such as how do we feel welcome, what does the classroom environment look like, what does the decor of the building look like. And as we've gone through these things, toward the lateral part of the years, we have seen a very uh, a decrease in student enrollment, and it's common across those buildings where we have seen unused classrooms and a lot of other spaces where there are no scholars or no activity going on. So we know that there is a decrease in enrollment. And we know it's partially because of uh, charter schools, but I'm sure there are other factors as well. So to me, and I think in my rationale, if you have a building where it is less than one half field capacity, then it does not seem feasibly, economically feasibly, to operate that building. So I can understand that it's very important that we kind of merge buildings so we can maximize the building, create those joint for learning environments for all scholars. And when we look at uh, the teacher issue, the shortage of teachers, we know that the teaching profession is not a profession, profession on the uh, front burner for, school, for school, students in college right now. We know that we're always going to have an issue getting highly qualified teachers. If I reflect on the plan, what I see it doing is putting more highly qualified teachers in more buildings. Because when you merge those teachers in the new building, those scholars are going to have an access to someone who knows what they are doing, who's passionate about their doing, and who will make a difference in working with those scholars. I can also see in the plan where the district will be able to save money. That money can be channeled to um, create, add and create more innovative experiences and resources for all students and for to support teachers. So um, I know with the vacancies and everything, when we look at the c consolidation, we're looking for a win-win for all students. We know that by human nature, we do not like change. It takes us out of our comfort zone and it puts us in a place where we don't know that what the outcomes will be. But I think that this is a time when we look at this plan that all communities should come together, embrace this change, because I think it will truly have a tremendous positive impact on the continued success of the Jackson Public School District. Thank you for this opportunity. Next is Lee Bernard, support of the optimization plan. Yes, to the superintendent, to the school board, and to the citizenry of uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Good evening. I stand in support of the authorization plan that has been put together by the superintendent and his board. 
I've looked down to the one meeting and looked at the numbers and it's something that we need to do. And again, if I didn't say my name is Lee Bernard and I did attend Jackson Public Schools. I spent five years at Johnson Elementary and six years at Lanier High School. And I was there the first day that uh, Johnson opened back in 1957. But again, we just have to look at what's going on in Jackson. As an example, the school district at one time probably had around 33,000 students. Now we're talking about 18. And so therefore, we have to applaud you for making a decision with the people moving out of Jackson. And we have to take a look at the city leaders and the state leaders to help us work through some of these issues when it comes to losing population because that's, a, that's an issue. They have to look at the city to see how clean the city is. People have to pass by these burned down buildings on a daily basis to get to a school somewhere in the city of Jackson. But the school district students decline is real with overall population decline in the city, state of Mississippi. They have to look at what's really going on. And I have to, again, support you, so I support the proposal. And I understand that the school has to, school board has to make a decision. And you have done that, and we appreciate you and applaud you for what you have done. But again, we have to get the city and the state involved in what's going on in the city of Jackson. Again, I, I thank you for all you do. Thank you. Next is Joanne Mickens, support of the optimization plan. Good evening, Good evening. and thank you for the opportunity to share my opinions about the plan. Um, first of all, I am the Executive Director of Parents for Public Schools, and we are a public education advocacy organization that started in Jackson in 1989. So we've been around, I wasn't with them in 1989, but I have been <laughs> with the organization since 2006. And I would be, be remiss if I didn't recognize my colleague, Shawnee Cooley, our community liaison for Parents for Public Schools, who usually represents our organization in community meetings and other, uh, and keeps her finger on the pulse of what's going on in Jackson. Um, but before I was a, uh, the ED of Parents for Public Schools, I was a JPS parent. I have two children who are 10 years apart. So that means I spent a whole lot of years <laughs> in JPS. <laughs> my, my son graduated from Mora, go Mustangs, in 1997, and my daughter graduated from Mora in 2007. So I know a bit about JPS. Uh, my children attended, I had to write it down, uh, Davis, now Obama, Bailey, and Mora, of course. And my daughter attended Power APAC, Chastain and Mora. And over the years, I've seen the evolution or maybe devolution of our mm. district. When my son started school, there were over 33,000 students in the district. Today, they're under 19,000. And one of the things that we um, teach our parents in our parent engagement program is to make data-driven decisions. And if you look at the data, if you look at the decline in enrollment, if you look at the capacity that our buildings have and yet the number of students that are in them, when you look at the ages of some of the buildings, I mean, Eudora Welty attended Davis, and she's been gone a long time. So the <laughs> fact is, we're, we are um, we're still using <laughs> some very old buildings, and um, but it appears to me that the optimization plan is, is a data-driven decision. Um, it appears to me to be strategic, but also fiscally responsible. And as I think um, Ms. Gardner mentioned earlier, we don't like change, but we know it's inevitable, and we've got to recognize reality. And so I want to applaud Dr. Green and the school board for given us a plan to shoot at. And that means that you have given it due consideration, you've done your due diligence, you've come up with a plan, 
but you're also giving us an opportunity to poke some holes in it. But the fact is, we need a plan, and uh, when I was with Bell South, we didn't call it optimization, we called it re-engineering. But we need some re-engineering, and I think this optimization plan is a way for us to get there to make things better for our scholars and our entire community. Thank you. Next is Reginald Thompson, support of the optimization plan. Good evening, uh, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Green. Uh, I'm Reginald Thompson. I am a Jackson native. My dad was an attendee of Brinkley High School, Brinkley Middle School, and Brinkley Elementary School, only school he ever went to. Graduated in 1965. <laughs> I attended Watkins Elementary, Powell Junior High School, and Callaway High School, class of 93. I'm a local businessman. I spent 37 of my 48 years in Jackson, Mississippi. I'm intentionally in Jackson, Mississippi. Jackson has always been a special place, but we're in transition. If you look at the data, and we're in a data-driven society, we've got to look at the numbers. In 1980, when I was still a little boy, we had 202,000 people in the city of Jackson. Now we're under 146,000. We've lost about 30% of the population in the city limits of Jackson over the last 43 years. We've gone from 30 plus thousand students when I first moved back to Jackson almost 20 years ago to under 18,000. Those are the facts. Our tax base is decreasing. Our schools are distressed. I did the numbers. On the 13 schools that are uh, slated to be closed, the average age is 63 years old. That means that in 1960, the average building that's slated to be closed was built, which means that's two years before James Meredith integrated the University of Mississippi. Right now, we have a chance to shift gears, to do the things that are in the best interest of the students and the community so that we can take the resources, the limited resources that we have, and make better use of them. When you look at the holding cost for these buildings, you look at the, the nuisance and the the, the attraction of these buildings to bad things happening, that's not a good thing. We have enough resources when you take those buildings, optimize it, that hopefully we can see a whole new footprint at some point in the future for Jackson Public Schools. Because when you look at what learning looks like, I travel all the time, I see some billion dollar bond issues when I'm out in Texas, I see the things that they're doing. There's not more potential anywhere in the world than it is in Jackson, Mississippi. We have to do our job and you guys are doing the hard work of considering what has to be done from a fiscal standpoint, but we know it's very heartfelt. We know people are very heartfelt about the changes that have to happen. But I want to applaud you guys for looking at the numbers. I want to applaud you for, for making some hard decisions about what has to happen, because this is necessary to build the foundation of the next 50 or 60 years in Jackson Public Schools. So I'm in support of closing schools because it makes sense, and I know that you guys will make the right decision for the scholars and the community for Jackson, Mississippi. Thank you. <coughs> Finally is Tamara Butler Washington who wants to address you regarding the optimization plan. Good evening to Dr. Green and the board. My name is uh, Grace Butler Washington and I come to you this evening on two guards. I am the representative elect for House District 69 and the parent of a fifth year old at KC Elementary. I'm a product of Jackson Public Schools. I went to Whitfield Elementary, which is currently Pecan Park Elementary, Blackburn Middle School, and Jim Hill High School, where I was taught the best English and journalism by Barbara T. Hilliard. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here with questions from my constituents regarding the plan and to make sure that I have them correctly, one of the questions is, what is the plan to restore these schools that are closing in regards to them becoming an eyesore for the community or a financial burden on the district in regards to upkeep? When we say a financial burden, meaning are we still paying utilities if someone breaks in the building, things of that nature, how is that going to affect the district and become an eyesore? The second question that was posed to me was in regards to the decrease in numbers of students, has there been any information in regards to a restructuring of the organizational chart for the district to reflect the decrease in enrollment from the top to the bottom? I bring forward these questions and concerns from citizens of District 69 as well as myself as a parent of a student in Jackson Public Schools uh, to continue him to stay in Jackson Public Schools. Part of my District of 69 
the citizens will be affected by some of the closures. So these are concerns that citizens have who live within that community where our community is already plagued with crime and we're trying to improve our city, our district, and make it a safe environment and keep the community in the aspects that it's already in to move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just a reminder, community members who would like to make public comments should email their request to roswilliams at jackson.k12.ms.us no later than 4 p.m. the day of the meeting or appear in the person in the boardroom no later than 5.15 p.m the day of the meeting. Thank you. Next, we have information only items. <coughs> Review of various policies for amendment, BBBCB, school board member visits to school, GADE, sick days, and GBEL, computer usage data and security. Yes. Good evening again. The Office of the General Counsel is recommending that the Jackson Public School District's Board of Trustees review the following recommendations related to the amendment of the policies discussed below. For policy BBBCB school board member visits to schools, the Office of the General Counsel is recommending amendment of this policy to allow an extension of time for board members to satisfy the required visits to schools due to health issues or other catastrophic events. The recommended amendment for policy GADE sick days. The Office of the General Counsel is recommending an amendment of this policy to require employees to request um, the appropriate family and medical leave forms when they are out for a certain number of days due to an illness. To add a notification requirement for employees to alert their supervisors when they will need to take sick leave. And to add a provision for verification of sick leave usage when deemed necessary. And the final uh, recommended amendment is for policy GBEL, computer usage, data and security. And the Office of the General Counsel is recommending amendment of this policy to clarify what consists of district property and to clarify that the district retains the right to repossess this property at any time deemed necessary. Are there any questions? Thank you. Attorney, Attorney Harris, board members, are there any questions or comments? Thank you. Next, we have information action items. Approval of, and I believe this is um, Attorney Harris, General Counsel Larissa C. Harris. <laughs> <laughs> she, I'm about to call you the wrong name. Um, okay, uh, agreement of the legacy approval, rather, of Legacy Scholars Grant Agreement with Equal Justice Initiative and the Jackson Public School District. The Office of the General Counsel is recommending approval of the Legacy Scholars Grant Agreement between the Equal Justice Initiative and Jackson Public School District on behalf of the JPS Tougaloo Early College High School. JTEX has received a grant award from Equal Justice Initiative in the amount of $4,480 for 50 students and five chaperones to visit the Legacy Museum from enslavement to mass incarceration and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama on November the 9th, 2023. Okay. Is there a motion to... Thank you, Attorney Harris. Board members, are there any questions or comments? Questions or comments? Is there a motion to approve information about item A? So moved. Second. Board member Thompson has moved and the motion has been second mm -hmm. by board member McGuffey. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Are there no, are there any, I'm sorry. Okay. 
Uh, there being none, the motion is approved. Thank you. Okay, next item, approval of agreement between the Community Foundation for Mississippi and the Jackson Public School District. Dr. Schomer, grant manager. Good evening, members of the board and Superintendent Green. The administration recommends approval of the agreement between the Community Foundation for Mississippi and Jackson Public Schools. The NEA Foundation has awarded JPS a $66,000 grant to support the expansion of the JPS Community Schools project within the linear feeder mm -hmm. pattern. As per the NEA Foundation grant agreement, the Community Foundation for Mississippi will serve as fiscal agent. The Community Foundation for Mississippi will receive funding acting as fiscal sponsor for the NEA Foundation and Jackson Public Schools. Mm -hmm. This is our fourth grant from the NEA Foundation. The grant opportunity was made available through the NEA Foundation, which supports the community school strategy across the country. Community schools are a powerful and proven strategy for achieving the goal of educational equity. Using schools as hubs, community schools bring educators, families, policy makers, and community partners together to increase the resources, supports, and services available to children, families, and communities. Funding from the NEA Foundation will be applied to funding the full-time on-site community school coordinator at Lanier, who is responsible for facilitating the process of transforming the school into a full-service community school. Other grant funds will be applied to family engagement, health services, enrichment, supplies, equipment, travel, administrative fees, and so forth. The Community Foundation for Mississippi has been identified by the NEA Foundation to serve as fiscal agent for the project. Mm -hmm. The grant project supports district commitment to innovative teaching and learning and commitment for joyful learning environments. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Schumer. Board members, are there any questions or comments? Uh, Madam Chair, just one. In this, yes. Uh, how many, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Mr. Schumer, how many previous from the MEA Foundation? MEA? We, uh, this is our fourth. We've had okay. three other grants to help support the strategy. All right. For the same school project, though? Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Can we have that something like that for other schools if they have? Uh, yes. In fact, uh, Dr. Green, it would probably be best if maybe we came back at another meeting where Dr. Merritt could address the strategy within the district. Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Just to kind of add to that yep. um, and to your question. So those, the, uh, these are, they started as planning grants from Correct. the NEA Foundation and and although there's still some opportunity and expectation around planning, we've started to move into more of the organizing ourselves to provide um, more of the, the community supports for scholars. Correct. Also, we've, we've gotten these grants from the community, uh, from the um, NEA Foundation, but we received a, um, a larger grant from, and I'm spacing right. now yeah, that's okay. we, we did receive a larger grant um, to support us in in launching this work um, and I believe we received that last last school year and so the team has been working hard to identify resources the team is actually um, making some national um, friends and acclaim in our planning our efforts our, our even vision for um, uh, community schools in our district. We wanted to start with a, um, a particular school and then we went to a feeder pattern. Um, and we want to be smart about scaling from there before we jump to other schools because the goal here, and I, I'm still learning about, I, I, community schools have been in every district where I've been, but I'm still learning about what they are and what they could be. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but the the goal there is not simply to have someone to run to when the scholar has a specific need um, clothing um, health supports or something like that the goal is to create um, a set of partnerships 
around the schools and district um, to where we're sitting together thinking through some of the larger issues that are not just about this one scholar needing some service provision. And that's something that we've got to really develop. We've got to really develop the, the partnership and the vision and the, the strategies, the structures that um, help us to be thinking beyond immediate needs that need to be uh, addressed to how we work together for our schools, not just, you know, uh, community members supporting district needs right. or family needs. I, and I, I totally get that, totally get that. I just was very excited to hear when I sat in on the seminar a few weeks back at the um, School of Instruction that the PTSA, mm -hmm. um, Jackson Council PTA put on, and they were talking about the whole sc community schools model mm -hmm. and the potential of what, and I, and I know that certain districts, well, certain, not districts, excuse me, certain schools and, and areas are kind of structured such that they need that extra kind of support. Yes. You know, um, and, and could be in, in meaning like the Wingfield area, because ever since I've been there, it's like that, those, that family of, of, of schools and communities and in that area. It is different from the, the other ones, right? And I think that they could work a really good model like that to be support to themselves yeah. and the community around and the district, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, and then finding and sourcing, like you just mentioned, federally and all of that, monies right. to be able to, to support a model that, that feeds that community. Yes, ma'am. Or fuels or supports that community. Some of it is finding additional dollars, grant dollars or otherwise, to fund and support the long-term investments there. And some of it is simply finding folks who are doing that the kind of work that we might need mm -hmm. and just getting them more thoughtfully and intentionally co connected to those schools and communities and families. Um, w my charge to the team has been, you know, before we jump out there and make commitments across the city, mm -hmm. let's do this right. Mm -hmm. Let's do this in a really thoughtful, intentional way, one that can be sustained and then scaled. Mm -hmm. um, I just refuse to, just to have uh, community schools in name, mm -hmm. and then you go into the schools and you don't see the kind of connective tissue that you see in some places where we've visited. Mm -hmm. and, and other places where I've been. I've seen it work really, really well. And I've seen it where it's been kind of milk toast, where you've, you've got the name, maybe you've got someone whose job is to help make things happen, but it's not a part of the, the water, the air, the ground on which we walk. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to see, what I think we need to see um, before we rush to scale. Makes sense. <clears throat> Are there other comments? Thank you for that clarity. Um, Dr. Green, thank you, Mr. Schumer. Uh, board members, are there any questions or comments? Any more questions or comments? Okay. Um, <coughs> you say a motion to approve. So Information move, action Chair. item B. I so move. Second. Okay. Um, it has been moved by Mr. Fierce and second by Ms. Thompson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, no nays. There being none, the motion is approved. Now, uh, Mr. Burks, Chief Operating Officer, will present items C through L. Give you a whole lot to do. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I, I have been threatened to be swift. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Uh, board, Superintendent uh, Dr. Green, the audience, 
Uh, I have the opportunity to present. Uh, the, the administration recommends that the Board of Trustees approve the lease agreement between Jackson Public School District and Eric Baggett, located at 303 Wilmington Street, Jackson, Mississippi, identified as tax parcel 201-93-2 and 201-93-4. Uh, this request will allow the lessee to rent the 16th section property at the above listed location. This, this lease agreement is being executed for 30 years and will expire September 22nd, 2053. The property has been appraised as of January 29th, 2020 with a fair market annual rent of $7,000 and the property will appraise every 10 years thereafter with the next scheduled appraisal in September of 2030. Uh, they are uh, operating a towing and salvage auto repair facility on this property and have been there before. Okay. Item, thank you, Mr. Burke. Board members, are there any questions or comments? Information, action, item C. We're going to take them all together. Okay. All right, uh, information item D, Mr. Burke. Yes, Madam President, the Vice President. Uh, the administration recommends that the board approve the monthly financial report for the month ending September 30th, 2023. The preliminary monthly financial report contains the statements of fund balance, budget status report, the bank reconciliation report, and the district maintenance cash flow report. Highlights of the report are as follows. In the statement of unbalanced section of the report, this is for general funds, uh, the funds 1,000 through 1999. Uh, for 2024, the beginning fund balance was $22,784,773 as of June 30th. Uh, fiscal year 2024 fund balance as of 9:30 was $10 million. This is uh, $3.9 million lower than our position in FY22. Uh, September's position. Um, there was a question by, about this, so briefly, very briefly, uh, the Hines County, uh, on September 7th, 2023, Hines County suffered a computer system shutdown in response to a ransomware attack. Hines County, as I will remind you, levies and collects and distributes our school Avalorum tax requests, uh, tax revenues. As a result of this attack, during the month of September, we did not receive any Avalorum receipts from the county. They have resumed operations as of Tuesday, September 26, and we fully expect that all Avalorum receipts will be submitted to the district as soon as possible. So that is a, that, that lack of those collections and that submission um, caused that sort of, is contributing to that um, sort of decline in our fund balance, just particularly in that month. Okay. Uh, expenditures for that month also uh, exceeded our revenues by approximately $6.2 million. On a brighter note, 16 section revenues fund 1840. Uh, year to date, we've collected 241,000 of, uh, of the budget that amount. Uh, that's approximately 26% of what we've requested, what we budgeted to receive. Special revenue funds, 2000, these are the funds 2000 through 29.99. And these are our federal funds, uh, predominantly child nutrition uh, continues to carry a healthy fund balance in fund 2110. Our titles, our uh, corona uh, virus response funds, which are our CARES and our ESSERS, uh, IDEA funds and other special revenues um, continue to show negative balances. Uh, but it's due to the timing of drawdowns, we are carrying about a $10.7 million negative but we have uh, submitted drawdowns in the amount of 9.2 there, so there is a $1.5 million gap. I will remind you and, and point to you to that that gap has closed tremendously. When we first started the year, we were carrying somewhere around 13 and we were only submitting about five. We're really working hard to close the gap uh, on those drawdowns and get a much better and stronger process around that. Um, budget status report section as of September 30th of 2023, in our main operations fund, 1120, we have collected $25.1 million in revenues. We have expended $37.8 million, and there is a $12 million uh, lag. In all other funds, we've collected $17.3 million. We have expended 40.3, and there's a $23.6 million lag between those two numbers. 
Bank reconciliations, as of August 31st, 2023, all district bank accounts are with board approved depositories. The bank statements are reconciled appropriately and promptly. In the cash flow report section on fund 1120, as of September 30th, the ending cash balance was $3.7 million compared to our September 22 balance of 4.2. Uh, this is roughly a 13.4% uh, decrease from the prior year's balance. And this is again due primarily to um, some lags between our expenses that we paid and those, um, the cash from those reimbursements. And then other uh, management key performance indicators, our overall revenue collections year to date are 3 million less than last year. Overall expenditures, 1.8, uh, 5% uh, greater than last year. Avalon collections are 2.2 uh, less than last year. And again, that's uh, primarily due to the fact that we didn't collect any revenue from Avalorm in this last in this month. Uh, and then personal, personnel and benefit costs year to date are three hundred and sixty thousand dollars greater than last year. And that is the financial report for okay. September thirtieth, twenty twenty three. All right. Thank you. Uh, approval of the resolution authorizing and directing the issuance of a tax and revenue anticipation note, TAN, on behalf of Jackson Public School System in the amount of $20 million, billion, million. Million, million, million. <laughs> yeah, not billion. <laughs> yeah, help me with these, these million. numbers. <laughs> million, yes, ma'am. For fiscal year 2023-20, through 2024, Mr. Merrick. Yes, ma'am. The administration recommends the approval of the resolution authorizing and directing the issuance of a tax and, and revenue anticipation note, otherwise known as a TAN, in the amount of $20 million for fiscal year 23-24. The issuance of this TAN is needed to finance the district's current operations until Avalorum uh, tax revenue is received. These notes are issued in accordance with Section 3759-37 of the Mississippi Code as annotated 1972. The district's payroll and accounts payable disbursements exceed the Avalon and Mississippi Adequate Education Programs, our MA, MAAP revenue collections from May through December. This is typical and uh, in our district. Approximately 85% of our Avalon collections are received between January and May. The TAN provides the district with the cash flow necessary for the months of November to January for daily operations. Cash flow requirements are forecast to determine the size of the TAN. So in your, in, in your financial report, you will see us track. We track monthly. Our cash flow is monitored very, very closely. And this uh, $20 million infusion helps us until we get our major Avalon collections in January. Okay. Okay, are there questions or comments? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Approval of Jackson Public School District's Emergency Management Plan. Yes, ma'am. At this yes. time, I want to take the opportunity to introduce our new Director of Emergency Management. He is going to, I know my name is down there, but I'm going to give him the opportunity to come and greet the board and present this item. Okay. Very, very quickly. All right. Mr. Thank Mark you. Young. <laughs> Emergency management. Let's welcome our new team member. <laughs> Newish. <laughs> Dr. Green name? and to the board. Good evening. Name? Mark Young. This is the recommendation and action for the administration to the board approval for the revision of 2023 20, 24 Jackson Public School District Emergency Operation Plan, known as the EOP. The rationale or the justification annually revising and updating the emergency operation plan for the district is essential to secure, secure that we are well prepared for involving, involving challenges and to meet regulatory requirements. The new look, the layout, along with content changes will help us enhance the clarity, accessibility, effectiveness of the plan, ultimately contributing to our safety and well-being of our school district. The changes from 2022 to 23 to 2023 to 24 include the following. A table of content 
has been included for improved document navigation. Number two, page numbers have been added. Number three, on page three, the Jackson, Jackson Public School Emergency Management mm -hmm. Department will now conduct annual training for school employees on the EOP. Pages six and seven, the emergency levels have been revised. Number five, page 11, features for a replacement of the security assessment and vulnerabilities is now with the threat hazard identification risk assessment, known as the Thyra. On page 17, number six, the terminology EOC and IC commander in the response flow chart has been updated to now the emergency management director and campus enforcement chief. Number seven, pages 90 through 111 have been removed due to redundancy. Are we ready to address an active shooter event in our school? While schools have revised and updated their individual school level crisis plan, we are better, uh, as I can say, better prepared across the district and with our other partners, our other agencies, we can coordinate their response to mm -hmm. any crisis. Have we conducted the necessary training to prepare for such event? Yes. Our school principals have conducted the required drills as called for their crisis response plan and they have adequately prepared to respond. Again, additional training coordination is needed at the district and the community levels. If there is such an event, who will respond to our schools when they call? In the event of a school, active school shooter event, calls are routed to 911. 911 will then route that to Jackson Public School District Camp Enforcement Dispatcher. However, all law enforcement, law enforcement agencies will respond. Who will be in charge of the situation? And that depends merely on the circumstances. We always say who arrives first. In any instance, uh, the highest ranking responding officer will resume charge until the chief of campus enforcement arrives. Those are the revisions and the also questions answered to the EOP for 2023-2024. Thank you for the reports, uh, Mr. Burr, board members, and Mr. Yes. Um, are there any questions or comments? on any portion of that report? Chief Operation Officer. Is there a motion to approve? I, actually, before we get there, I, I do have a couple of quick questions just on D, in particular the financial reports. Um, so, Mr. Burke. Yes, sir. Um, I, I just want to touch back on something you mentioned and, and, and and walk through in response to the board questions, but I, I, I want to make sure I understand kind of what's under underneath some of the some of those issues on the Ed Warren taxes. All right, I'm correct in saying we expect nothing changed because of that ransomware attack in our overall ex expectations for for our receipts on Ed Warren collections. Correct. You're correct. It's just a lag. Yes. All right. They were unable. To, they were. They sh shut down and they were not able to do business. Um, the second question I have is on the expenditure side. Could you could you shed some light on what is what the drivers were? I mean, it could be as simple as if you told me expenditures were higher because we had to buy more AC units, I would believe you. Yes. But what's driving that? So typically, our expenditures in the beginning of the year lag behind revenues. Yep. Um, that's because we get MAP monthly. We get Avalorm in a in small trickles through probably December, January is when people pay taxes. But this, but we are working really, really hard to spend our ESSER funds, spend all this, spend all, bid all these projects. We got all of those things going and, and we're having to pay for that in order to meet these, the, the, the aggressive timeline that we have. So that is going to be the, 
our, our lived experience probably well into the end of this fiscal year, just trying to get those projects done and paid for. And that's, that's just on that side. And then the normal operational stuff. So that, so, so is it, is it those project, those project timelines that's driving the, the that a roughly $2 million increase in expenditures? Yes. I mean, yeah. we, we, there's, because we're, again, we're trying to be very aggressive um, in getting those, those projects bid out and, and completed. Okay. Last thing yes, for me, um, it, this is not a question. I want to applaud the process improvements. Um, I work in a business that has to review pro formas, send bills out, collect, and that timeline, the shorter we get that timeline, the better off we all are, right? Yes. And so I just want to I just want to acknowledge the work that y'all have done even since I joined this board in reducing, truncating that amount of time between expense and submission and reimbursement, right? That is a that is a complicated process and it makes a huge difference. So, like you said, to our operational flexibility um, month to month. So, I just want to applaud the work that's been done on the CARES and ESSER and all of those projects that we're submit that we're where we got to pay it out and then we got to and then we got to get it back in. Um, and I appreciate you well done. pointing that out and appreciate that accolade. But I will share that with uh, Dr. Scott is here. She works really hard. Her and her federal uh, uh, programs team. I I, I really push them and they really it, there, there's a lot that goes along with this It's not just an in-house operation I mean there's the Department of Education because this is reimbursement mm -hmm. so it, them yeah. adopting that philosophy let's get it done as quickly as we can it's, it's been great to work with them and, and they do a great job and then there's the rest of my people who are never That's here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they're all great I, I just want to piggyback and say that is really good and it was really good to even for 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 community that was really wondering like why y'all not spending the money for them to understand that this is a reimbursement process like we have to have the money in order to get the things yes. and then we get being reimbursed you know so there's a process and this stuff doesn't happen magically so but but y'all make it look like it does <laughs> well part of it is i mean dr green has done a great job of, of, mm -hmm. of understanding it, and you as a board have done a great job of understanding and allowing me to to say that hey we we want the money but it's not really money until we spend it we have to have the money in-house yeah. to carry those expenditures until we get those those reimbursements and i don't think the general public typically understands when jps is awarded something from the federal government. That money, that's a promise to pay. It's not money that's dropped into our bank accounts. Right. Not sitting in your coffee or something. Right. Yeah. And, and Are there other I, questions, I, comments? I, I just want to, um, you know, echo uh, some of what you're saying there and put a finer point on it. And so you've got, uh, as one of the items here, this request for approval for the tax anticipation note. Well, in normal times, we need that. Because again, we, we don't get all of our money at the start of the year. We get it trickled over the months and, and heavies up in January, I believe January and February from um, taxes. And so in normal times, we need that tax anticipation note to help ease our uh, cash flow so that we can make payroll and we can pay the bills and we can do some of the repairs and things. That's in normal times. Well. With the, um, with the additional ESER funds that we're so, so pleased to have, I want to be real clear, we're thankful to have those, but it, but it further stretches and stresses our budget because we've got to first uh, expend that, that money and pay for it and then get reimbursed. And so all of the money that's, that's churning out, and, and I really do thank um, – Mr. Burke and Dr. Scott and, and all of the other team members who have a hand in approving the invoices when they come in and getting them submitted and, and up for payment and submitted to MDE, all of that is, is a ton of work in order to try to collapse the time of invoicing and, and reimbursement. But also with this other piece about our, um, our cash flow in mind, we've got to constantly monitor that so that we can make payroll so that we can pay the light bills and all of these other things. And so this, while it's a great benefit to have those additional dollars and it's a lot of money, it's also a huge stress on our budget and the, the team is having to watch that with eagle eyes to make sure we don't get below the levels that we need to so that we can operate month to month. And so did wanna just 
further uh, stress how important that piece is, especially in these times. So I, I, I've got one more. I, I'm so sorry, Ms. Hogan. No, no, go on. Uh, I've got one more set of questions that really has to do with the EOP. Um, and this is sort of educational for me, um, trying to play catch up a little bit. Um, do we have, what is the district's sort of uh, notification mechanisms? Like I, I see in there that, that notice will be sent out. and But I'm wondering what are the actual mechanisms that go out to parents, for example, if there's a crisis at a particular school. So um, the only thing I can do is analogize it to what I know, which is what my office does, right? We've got some text thing that hits my computer and my phone and it, it like taps me on the shoulder and something else. Like it, it just, it's a program called Stop It and so it just pops up, right? So I'm wondering what the actual um, notification mechanisms we have, how much redundancy is built into those. That's thing one. The second question that I have is just, um, and I think this is a little bit what the question was touching on about who's in charge. How much work have we done um, uh, trying to wrap our arms around the, um, I'll say, unique situation with law enforcement in the city of Jackson between campus enforcement, JPD, uh, uh, CAP police, Hines County, uh, sure. the Sheriff's Department is certainly the closest responder for some of our schools. And so um, if we could talk a little bit about that, just so I understand what our interplay is on yes, the responders. So to the first one, um, we do use school status. Um, which is both email and text and, and uh, I say both, and phone call. Um, so there's, uh, there's a way to target communications just to the school community, to the parents of a particular school community, and, or, or to everyone, just depending on the circumstances of the event. Um, folks also have uh, uh, text groups. Um, uh, uh, principals will often have those or will use um, ch uh, phone chains um, because not everyone gets texts and so there, there are few kind of redundancies around the communications. Um, sometimes f Facebook will be used but typically it's more to quell some of the background noise about what's happening when it's ill-informed or people guessing or what have you just to kind of calm people down. So that's to the first. Um, to the second point, and, and I would absolutely uh, say that there's, there's more work to be done here, especially as the landscape and, and the partners continues, continues to change um, with the Capitol Police and with others. I, I was reminded that we've actually got several uh, law enforcement entities or agencies in this area, and frankly, any of them could show up if an all call goes out on 911. If there's an active shooter, you'll likely have everybody in the area to show up, and that is, of course, campus enforcement. That's also Jackson Public uh, Jackson Police Department, Capitol Police. You've got the um, the sheriff's office, Hines County. You've got. Uh, Wildlife Wild, Patrol. Wild Patrol. Is it wildlife? Wildlife fisheries. 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 Yeah, yeah, every, everybody's coming. Everybody's yes. Coming. And, you know, and, you know, so all of the, the agencies, as I've understood it, and we've got Chief in the room, but I've asked this of Chief uh, a few times and of um, the folks at JPD as well, just to, because I want to reiterate and make sure that I'm getting it clear. When the call goes out and there's something like that that happens, it's an everybody, everybody come down, everybody show up because you don't know how many people or, you know, you just don't know all of those things. Everybody um, who can responds. <clears throat> the first one on the scene, the first sworn officer on the scene um, is expected to take some action. So if there's something that is occurring that you see and needs some action then, then they take action. And that occurs until the ranking um, member of, um, and in this case it would be uh, campus enforcement, the ranking member of campus enforcement always in co conjunction with partners, ranking partners from the other agencies. But there's, a, there's an understanding, and maybe it's in law policy and the training or what have you amongst um, uh, sworn officers, but if you get there, you gotta, you're, 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 you're first at bat. 
Um, and then, of course, if there's if it's something that they would need to wait on uh, backup, they'll do that. Um, but there is a, a, a kind of a, a a way that they fall into a groove together as they show up. OK, whose jurisdiction is this? It's a JPS jurisdiction. We don't play those games with regard to safety. And so we want to work in partnership with all the the resources that um, are available here. FBI. I didn't mention them, FBI or MBI, Mississippi, yeah. uh, could also show up. And, and depending on the incident, you know, it might make sense that they take command. And so these are things that the, the um, leadership will, will determine in the moment based on the issue and what resources we have there. Unfortunately, it's not, a, you know, it's not always a if this, then that. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, you know, there are some um, proven, as I understand, and of course I'm not a sworn officer, there's some proven and, and uh, typical behaviors when it comes to those sorts of things so that folks aren't tripping over one another and we're not all sitting back waiting on somebody else to take action. Did I do that justice, Chief? Okay. Mm -hmm. right. I've been listening. <laughs> I appreciate it. Ms. Hilliard, thank you for indulging me. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add again, I'm still waiting on an update uh, from our uh, safety people, yes. got from the, you know, the students concerned when they did their walkthrough of the schools and the classroom having the book and the teacher maybe taking the book and all of that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, like what happens? How do they secure themselves in the room? You know what I mean? The teachers safety book gotcha yeah do y'all remember that yes yes I do. okay i do okay can we, can we figure out when we can make that happen and yes. get back all right um miss williams you'll make sure that we get it scheduled on a board meeting thank you okay. is there a motion to approve item c through f motion second it has been moved by Mr. McGuffey and second by Ms. Thompson to approve items C through F. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No nays. There being none, the motion is approved. Okay. Next, we have the consent agenda items in finance. Um, all the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously, and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items? Finance. So moved. Move. Second. It has been moved by Mr. Figures and second by Ms. Thompson to approve items, consent, the consent agenda finance items. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, there being none, the motion is approved. Next, we have the consent agenda items, personnel. All the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously, and we have had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. If there are no further questions, if not, board members, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda personnel? <coughs> Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, it has been moved by Ms. McGuffey and second by Ms. Thompson. Move that Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Second. You second. Okay, you second the motion. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, there being 
No nays. The motion is approved. Is there a consideration to hold an executive session? <laughs> if not, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right, it has been moved by um, Ms. Thompson and seconded by Ms. McGuffey. Uh, there being. Mr. Second by Mr. Figures. Oh. <laughs> there being none, the meeting is. A, uh, Oh, we vote. We vote. All in favor. Very unfair. Trying to get down out here. <laughs> All right. There being none, <laughs> the meeting is approved. The learning should be creative and fun. And she is going to continue her marvelous journey as an educator and never stop learning and growing. Ms. Thomas says she is a phenomenal math and science teacher. She is impressed by her work ethic and the joy she exudes when working with scholars years in community. I want to thank my principal, Ms. Kyle Baker Thomas, for nominating me. And my first principal, Ms. Dr. Mitchell Shears, that was where I all started from at Clausell. I thank my family and friends for supporting me for these last 16 years. I'm so honored and humbled to be standing here today. Thank you. And, <laughs> and thank you, um, Community Foundation for Mississippi. Thank you. Our next honoree is Ms. Trina Davis, a fifth grade teacher at Dawson Elementary. Ms. Vicki Conley Walters is her principal. Dion Woody is the assistant superintendent for that district. Ms. Davis has 13 years of experience in education. She has a bachelor's of science degree in elementary education. She has been named Metro Jackson Teacher of the Year, Dawson Teacher of the Year, Distinguished Educator Award, and Perfect Attendance Award. She's never met a child she could not teach, and today is no different. This feat is achieved with understanding that all students can learn if one truly takes the time to identify the unique approach that is warranted for any child to learn. Ms. Davis is one of 2023 Outstanding